Hello and welcome to Pots and Trowels. I'm Martin Fish, joined as usual by Sean and Jill. Hi. I've got lots happening on this episode, including a visit to Barnsdale Gardens, which was the home and the garden of Jeff Hamilton, who presented BBC Gardener's World for many years, now run by his son Nick. So we're going to look at the garden and how it's developed. Great, and we've got some listeners' questions, one about a fig tree, one about rhubarb and how best to dry seeds. But first, let's go to Barnsdale and have a chat to Nick. Well, hello, Nick. Good to see you. Hello, Martin. Well, we're in the winter garden here at Barnsdale, and it, you know, here we are coming towards the end of March now, but it's still got so much colour. Well, I think you find that um, it's just been looking fantastic this year, and uh, but it's like a lot of, of the things that we do, it, it's about value for money. So although it's our winter border and the main focus of it is for the winter, it's actually an all-year-round garden. So you know, as it starts to lose its winter interest, other things kick in, and it, and it gives us interest right the way through the year. Yeah, and the good thing about this is it, it's not a huge, it is a big area, I suppose, compared to lots of gardens, but not too big. But it, I think it gives people lots of ideas, inspiration, because people often design their garden or plant it through the spring and summer when they do visits to a garden centre, but forget the winter interest. But by coming here, it just demonstrates that you can have some really lovely plants that you mix in with the garden that will shine from sort of December through till April. Yeah, I think definitely it's about having enough in a garden you know and this border here you will have noticed that I've put pathways through it to sort of separate it into smaller little bits as opposed to being just one big area so uh, but but it is just about having enough in the winter we're always going to have less if we have a summer garden because we just don't have the space to put things but it's about having enough just to lift your heart in Mm. the winter because that's really what we need isn't it yeah it is yeah on those gloomy days and i mean it's not that we get a lot of rain of course in in england is it these days no no i I, early i have to say that that in during january and february i I thought about diversifying and investing in a fleet of canoes it was that bad oh really (laughs) oh right um so before we have a chat a bit more um i mean a lot of people listening to the podcast will i'm sure be fully aware of Barnsdale uh, either visited it or seen it on the television but for those that don't know just tell us a bit about your background and and how Barnsdale became. Okay so uh, my dad um, was the editor of Practical Gardening magazine it was a magazine that is no more Um, but in um, in 1979 he was the editor of that magazine and and therefore regarded as a gardening expert and the BBC came knocking on his door asking if he'd come and guest on one of the Gardeners World programmes and so that's what he did um, over in Birmingham and uh, the, the producer at the time obviously saw massive potential there and asked him back very quickly and and that was his his way in and before he knew it he was on there presenting on an irregular basis but quite regularly in 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 that respect Uh, and and gradually um, the things that uh, he wanted to do and talking to the producer about uh, had to be set up at Barnsdale so they gradually started coming to Barnsdale and that's how it started now the original Barnsdale is is about a mile away from here Mm -hmm. Uh, and um, and after being on the tv for three years he only rented that property they the family that owned it decided they were going to sell and and the the area that we're at now the house at the top came on the market with five and a half acres of land he bought that uh, and started developing that from a, just from pasture and then in 1989 we bought the the adjoining field and that's when i came back so i can't tell you how long i've been here i've been here so long martin i, I can't remember <laughs> how many years it is now but anyway it's, it's over 30 years and about 33 34 years and so um you know it, it we've been developing that and then uh, when he um, sadly passed away in 1996 i knew that i was going to inherit the garden um no money he left me no money mm. the, the old devil yeah but a garden is priceless <laughs> isn't it it is it is very a lot of work to do on <laughs> yeah. it though to get it ready yeah. for people and we opened in 1997 and been open every, every day ever since yeah and it is it is amazing i mean i remember watching gardener's world when your dad was presenting had the pleasure to meet him a couple of times and he was very much a, a practical hands-on gardener wasn't he you know he did it all himself and it, a lot of it was about making it doable for people as well he wasn't trying to be you know high up there doing something special he was trying to bring it down to everybody's level so they could enjoy their garden yeah that's what, i mean he was just he was just a normal bloke 
who, who, whose job was as a gardener, who, who enjoyed it as a passion. It was his hobby as well as his job. Uh, and, and, and you're right. And what you got on the television was exactly what you got. Mm. I mean, there was no act. That's exactly what he was like. Uh, and, and so uh, it, and I think that was his great, um, not skill, that was his great asset was the fact that he was able to create this connection with viewers that had never met him, who regarded him as a close friend. And, and that's something you can't learn. That's something that you, you have a natural ability to do. And he connected with people through the medium of television. And he could have told them to do anything and they would mm. have gone out the following morning and done it. Yeah. That, that was the, the way that they, that they looked upon him and, and, and loved him for it. And I still get people coming and they talk to me about my dad and they start to well up which is never good because it you know then then I'm now then I'm fighting back the tears after you know when they start yeah. so but but you know to have that sort of effect on people 27 28 years on you know is is just staggering really yeah well it is amazing I, I do a lot of talks to gardening groups and it, it's surprising how many still say you know we remember watching Jeff Hamilton we loved it when he was presenting Gardener's World so you know that legacy is going to be there for a long long time yeah I think so and I think uh, you know I think it's for us as a family and, and certainly for me it, the, the great thing is that they use him as a yardstick as to which to compare everybody else by mm. uh, which is great but I think the you know the, the, what he's left here at Barnsdale and bear in mind that you know the garden is a work in progress as most people's gardens are it's not a historical thing so this in in the sort of the 27 nearly 28 years that he's he's been gone has moved on quite a lot and lot quite a lot has changed and and that's a great thing to be able to leave for people to come and enjoy come and learn from as, as well as enjoy but but his great legacy were those millions of people who were inspired by what he did on the tv and learned every week and and have improved their lives by getting out in the garden more mm. Yeah, and you've, you know, it's a big act to follow because the gardens have developed and evolved tremendously in the time you've been. As you, like you say, gardens don't stand still. You've got to keep moving forward. But you've kept that very much that feel. I think anybody that watches any old tapes of Gardener's World, because it was basically lots of small gardens within a big garden, and you've kept that lovely feel to it. It's very intimate. Oh, absolutely, and, and I think that, that that's not deliberate that's me doing my thing but of course uh, you know I, I was um, 34 when my dad passed away and so I had 34 years of being indoctrinated in the Jeff <laughs> Hamilton style of gardening yeah. so I was all it was always going to be a, a similar way of doing it and you know and and the whole reason is that you know what the, the way that people are inspired by watching him on the television you know I was inspired by by him being in person and inspiring me in person so you know but I've been I've, I'm you know made from the same mold really aren't I yeah you are yeah you you sound like him and you look like him so you know yeah, you, are. you can't see the Hamilton legs either and I keep those well hidden I can assure right. you <laughs> yes well I, I know you've not got a skirt on today so no you, they're well hidden under yeah. your jeans so shall we just have a little walk because we, we say the yeah. winter garden is looking sure. great um so so, you know, do you want to just pick out a few plants that are looking good that might inspire people to put them in the garden if they haven't already got them, Nick? Yeah, absolutely. I think that things like the uh, Sorberia um, Sem here, um, it's, a, it's actually a relative of the Spirea. Uh, but when it comes out uh, uh, early on, it has this really sort of beautiful salmon pink to the to the front of the foliage and of course as you can see the older foliage is sort of a lime green yellowy color behind it so the the salmon pink really stands out and then later on in the season it has spirea like um mm. cones of spirea like flowers but it's a lovely thing it's a it's a suckering shrub but it's a it's an absolutely beautiful thing and and looks great at this time of year and of course the hellebores have been flowering for for weeks now and and they look great pulmonary areas are still just about hanging on in there yeah. um, and there's some really beautiful in actual fact today um, you know the light is is subdued so therefore things like blue ensign the, the really sort of bluer ones really really stand out on this mm. sort of light level that we have today um, and, and they're looking absolutely fantastic and really do lift the heart. I have to say, you know, early on with the, with the snowdrops, I like, and I have, deliberately planted just tiny little clumps of snowdrops in, in places where there are no others. And certainly as you walk round a corner, because I just think as you walk round a corner, and I know they're there, but they still surprise me <laughs> and they still lift my heart. And so yeah. I do that with other things as well. So things like the Pullman areas at this time of year and hellebores, it's nice to have them in a drift and have, you know, nice, really big clumps of them. But also don't discount having little bits just dotted about in odd little places. Yeah, and it gives you that continuity as well, doesn't it? It links it all yeah, together. As you, as you go, really. I'm intrigued here. There's a, 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 is it a, is it a magnolia? 
It is a magnolia. Uh, but it looks a very dainty, yeah. evergreen magnolia. It's, a, it's a, one of the sort of the newer newer varieties. It's a, a variety called Fairy White. Um, the the thing we have here at Barnsdale is that the area we're in now, in, the, in where the winter border is, is is what I call the, the TV garden. So this is where my dad presented every Friday night, really, right. from. Uh, and then the other the other part of the garden I call the nursery garden part, because that was the, the bit that we bought in 1989 that was primarily I developed the nursery and then the garden area around it. Now, the, the soil in this bit is a pH of around 6.5 to 7, mm-hmm. whereas the pH in the other half of the garden is 8.3, because that's been intensively farmed oh, and brought the limestone to the right. surface with the subsoil. So in this part of the garden, we can grow magnolias, we can grow rhododendrons in the borders, we can grow pieris and things, but we can't in the other half of the garden. So you won't find any magnolias down there. So they're all up here. Um, but this is looking fantastic. And like I say, it's a newer variety, but it's one of those things that... You know, I point out when I when I walk around with people, if I'm doing a guided walk, or just generally wandering around the garden, and I see people. I talk about things like the buds. You know, when you when this is in bud, it's it's as interesting because the buds are this lovely sort of brownie colour and really stand out against the foliage as well. So it's not, you know, you've got quite a long period of interest mm, with it. Yeah. If you're looking, if you're opening your mind and looking at other things. And they flower for a long time, you know, because they. I've got. I think I've got the pink. There must be a pink fairy as well. Yeah. Mine's in a container. But it's quite nice to see how yours has grown because it's. It's not big, but it's not small. It's a nice, you know, garden plant for most situations. Um, and it, I'm, I need to get mine out the pot, I think, and in the garden. Now I've seen yours growing so well. Yeah. I need I think, to do I the think same. It, but it's also a little bit of thought about where to position it because, you know, th- at this time of year we can still get the odd frost. And, and and that can brown flowers if you're not careful. Yeah. So so a little bit more sheltered is, is quite nice in that respect. Brilliant. OK, well, can we have a wander up and cause look at the veg garden? Because I know you're big into your organic veg, aren't you? Yes, uh, absolutely. We'll have a wander up there, Nick. Yeah. Now, Martin, was that a bird scarer or were you on the run from someone? Was there somebody chasing with a shotgun? I, it, there was a it, noise in the background there. It did sound like a shotgun, but I'm assuming it was a bird. I hope it was a bird scarer in the field at the back of the garden there. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so it made us move on anyway. Now, tell us a bit more about Barnsdale, because you were in the winter garden and then later on in the podcast, you visit the veg garden. But there are lots of other separate gardens and areas at Barnsdale. Aren't there? I had a quick look at the website and I've been a couple of times times and remember them well but on the website I counted there are about over 38 different features and gardens so mm. there's an apple arch gentleman's cottage garden courtyard gardens woodland garden memorial garden so a lot of things to see yes I mean as essentially uh, Barnsdale is a series of small gardens on a big plot of land all linked together uh, with lawns and planting as well but mm. you've got these individual gardens all very different and that's why I think mm. it's such an inspirational place to visit because if you're thinking of laying out a new garden or want some ideas for planting you're going to get them there because there's going to be a, a garden to suit and mm. some of those original ones they've been redone admittedly but some of them were done by Nick's dad Jeff Hamilton on Gardener's world on the television back in the 90s but obviously since Nick's taken over since his father died there's been a lot more added so it is really interesting to wander around and see all those Mm. gardens and there is I noticed there is a memorial garden that's obviously to Jeff am I right in thinking that you planted a tree we, well we you came with me uh, <laughs> I was asked to plant a tree it was actually on the 10th anniversary uh, of Jeff dying so uh, I was invited along to a little ceremony to plant a tree in the long herbaceous borders which were the original ones that Jeff had done and then in the winter garden again that was done lots of uh, memorial trees and shrubs people provided them and there's a little plaque so I honestly can't remember what tree I provided for that but there is one in the <laughs> winter garden that's got my name on it there is an inevitable video plug coming here, I'm afraid, because you and I visited a few years ago, didn't we, Martin, and did a bit of filming mm-hmm. there. So if people want to see a bit more of Barnsdale, just go over to our YouTube channel. I'll put a link to that video in the show notes so that it's easy to find. Meanwhile, should we go back and hear from a bit more from Nick in the Veg Garden? Mm. So we're in the Veg Garden, Nick. This is the Veg Garden Dad used on Gardener's World. And... 
think some of these trees are probably the original, these cordons. Yeah, there's a half a dozen uh, cordons here. Uh, we've taken the supports away now because they're that old that they don't <laughs> need them. Uh, they're well set. But these, these are the originals, and, and he planted these in the winter of 1983, with wow. the first winter that he was here. Uh, and this is what we call our allotment area. Now, we've got our main sort of uh, visitor pathway separating out the two halves. But as we stand at the cordons looking down, this is this is sort of the average size of an allotment plot. Mm -hmm. But we've got a little bit behind us, and we've also got the full um, length again on the other side of the pathway, just purely because at its peak, um, he was presenting on Garden as well for 50 weeks of the year. And for every week, for that 50 weeks, he needed something vegetable or fruit-based to feature. Right. So yeah. we grew a lot. But we've always, and we still do, um, grow to eat. So it's, it's, sm it's small amounts of a lot of different things. And at the moment, you're now starting the sowing and the planting. Here we are, so the spring hopefully is with us. And, you know, it's going to be a busy time over the next month or so, isn't it? Getting all the seeds in, all the young plants in. Yeah, you have to say that quietly so Susie doesn't quite hear you because oh, right, she's the one okay. doing it. Yeah. Right. Um, but we've, we've been, I mean, we're under pressure a little bit because it has been so wet that, that we're a couple of weeks behind where we'd like to be. We just haven't been able to get on the ground. You know that, you know, we're very heavy clay here uh, and the field beyond our boundary hedge sort of slopes away upwards uh, and therefore because it's been so wet we've sort of taken a lot of that wetness that, yeah. that's come down from that as well so we're a little bit behind but we've now got you know the, the early carrots out and and uh, certainly uh, some multi-sown veg that we've done early on is, is all out and up and running one or two things still hanging on still got leaks in the ground one or two Brussels sprouts, celeriac and stuff. So we're still we're still harvesting as well, but this is the time of year when all of a sudden, you know, you're thinking, how are we going to fill all that space? And you blink and, and that's it, all filled up, isn't Yeah, it? and then you wonder, you know, yes, what can you, you're running out of space. To say you've got such heavy clay soil, though, it looks in really good condition, but I suppose that is just, you know, 40 years of continually adding compost and manure, which has really improved it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that that is one of the great benefits of being in such a horsey county, mm -hmm. you know, Know, there's plenty of manure about but also the fact that uh, and it always does make me laugh this newfangled recycling that's been going on for for 20 years you know the gardeners have been doing it for millennia exactly, haven't we? Yeah. you know recycling everything so lots of garden compost we put on here as well uh, and like you say it does in in and, and when i you know when i do my my veg courses here I, I we always come up here and we look and when and i always point out the level of the soil compared to the level of the pathway because it, in effect you know the allotment is one big raised bed because you can see the soil is raised is that just purely from adding that organic bulk which in, which t does help to improve the drainage yeah exactly and of course we we must talk about the fact that you are organic always have been dad you know dad was organic and that's something that i think you're very proud to carry on isn't it yeah absolutely we've been organic for just over 35 years now and we've been peat free for over 30 years so um we we, we carry Oh, that's, is that the time already? That's, that's, that's <laughs> time Ian, he's suddenly decided it's lunchtime. <laughs> oh, <they right>. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yes, it, it, it's something that we're very proud of and something that we, you know, we we like to talk to people about if they want to talk about it. We, we don't lecture people. It's entirely up to them as to, as to what they do. But, but certainly I think when you're growing edibles, uh, you know, organics is, is most certainly the way to go. And, and we look at the environment and the impact now. We really do need to become less particular about things mm, yeah no I, I agree and I think I think lots of people are now thinking we don't want to spray anything toxic on what we're going to eat uh, and you know by growing your own naturally you know exactly how it's been grown um, so what would you do though you know because I suppose one of the main problems with being organic is you can't reach for the spray even because you don't want to so what about pest control how do you deal with um, you know aphids or carrot root fly you know any tips for people to keep the pests off okay well a lot of the um, things like the, the aphids green fly black fly green fly we we use um, an environmentally friendly washing up liquid because it, it breaks down their protective outer coating and they they die from exposure to the environment basically things like um, carrot fly we use um, either a, a very fine mesh over the crop right from the, the word go so that's either from sowing or planting out you know our multi-sown crops or whatever and uh, and then we cover it in either with mm -hmm. this fine mesh or with fleece uh, and then that stays on and that helps with that you know cabbage root fly you're looking at things like the the square um, little pads that you put down we make them out of cardboard when you plant your plants out and then the the, the, the carrot root fly can't lay its eggs next to the plant so there's lots of 
physical barriers that you can put in the way and, and fleece and, and this fine mesh is really good over cloches as well because it, it creates a natural barrier that they can't get through but also allows light, air and moisture to, to pass yeah, both ways. Exactly. So it's really good, unlike polythene, which doesn't. Um, and But I think that... Like I said earlier, we, you need to be a little less particular. So, you know, when you've got white fly on, your, on the leaves of your Brussels sprouts, you know, your plants are established, they're producing good sprouts. The sprouts are fine. Why worry about the white fly that are feeding on the leaf? Don't worry about no, it. No, no. I mean, we, we find we get it on the kale, a lot on kale. Yeah. But it rinses off, or what doesn't rinse off is just it's, a bit of extra protein, it, isn't absolutely, it? Absolutely. It's not going to yeah, hurt you. Yeah. Absolutely. I, exactly. I can't tell you how many times I've cooked cabbage for my, my two <laughs> lads when they were young boys, and they don't know that there were little skins floating on the top of the water. <laughs> but they, you know, they've grown up into two, two strapping lads, exactly. so that's great. <laughs> yes. And I suppose, you know, you, you're very wildlife friendly as well in the garden i've been watching while we've been chatting you've got a bird feeder with there's been three or four blue tits on there and they're going to be great for getting rid of pests in the garden as well aren't they yeah and i think uh, that's one thing that we do find is a lot of the time people moan about the lack of wildlife in their garden but but a lot of that is down to years and years of spraying you mm. know in order to have the the predator which is what birds are and what the frogs and the you know are and and all the other lovely ladybirds all the other lovely things that we want in our garden you need some of the pest and it's about a balance between the two and and you're right we do we feed our birds uh, through the winter purely because we need to keep them here so that when we start to get the pest problems they're there to feed on them but it is about this balance so you do have to turn a blind eye sometimes if the balance becomes for a little while a little bit over you know more on the pest side than on the predator side so yeah. you know it's something we have to learn to live with. yeah it's and working with nature exactly isn't it so the garden uh what does it cover in total you, you a few acres now it's a, it's a, we're, we're between eight and eight and a half acres okay yeah. uh, and open all year round well we're, we only close um christmas eve christmas day and boxing day Right, okay. I, so. I very often follow that with for our sins, but it's me who decides that, so I shouldn't really... <laughs> no, short decision. <laughs> You're the boss. <laughs> exactly, yes. So, yeah, and, and, and this time, March to October, this time of year, we're open 9 till 5 every right, day. Right, okay. And you've already mentioned that you run courses here. You know, you do veg growing courses and, and lots of things happen throughout the year, so people can follow you on, on your website and find out what's happening. Yeah, on the website or on all the social media channels are on there as well, you know, and, and stuff. So, um, yeah, so it's not difficult to find us somewhere. No exactly and, and finally Nick I mean we've looked at the winter garden we're here in this amazing veg garden uh, I, I'm envious because we've got small raised beds where we've moved to and I, I just wish I'd got a bit more space like this so I might, I might come and do a little bit of hoeing or weeding yeah. one day but uh, <laughs> you, you're always changing and, and the garden and evolving it and there's some work you're doing in the other part of the garden as well at the moment isn't there? Yeah there's a couple of areas that we're just changing one of them um, which we walked past earlier on is, is next to our seaside retreat garden and we just felt that that border there was was not it had served its time really so I decided to redevelop it and to give it more of a beachy feel so we're, we're going to plant in in sort of patches in there and and use very sort of um, very well drained sort of more seaside based loosely mm -hmm. seaside based plants and, and then cover it all with sand and so it looks like it ties in with the with the beach hut and the seaside retreat garden yeah oh, we're looking forward to seeing that it'll be good and I say it's the sort of thing that gives people lots of ideas and inspiration all around the garden so if you haven't been to Barnes Barnsdale and you get the chance put it on your list it really is worth a visit Nick thank you for showing me around it's been great to see you again and, and thank you to Ian as well for joining us well it's always a pleasure from me and I'm sure it is from from him as well always to see you Martin <laughs> cheers thanks Nick <laughs> Good old Ian the Cockrell. <laughs> do you know, I tried to get him to do it afterwards and he wouldn't do it. Did but uh, So lovely to hear. I do miss having hens in oh, the garden. Amazing. I really do. We haven't the, got another The neighbours would love it if I got a cockerel. <laughs> I'm sure they would. To be yeah. fair, I think, didn't your neighbours have several cockerels once? I remember filming at your old house and the, yes. the, a few doors down had quite a few cockerels. And yeah, it, it got... <laughs> A little bit frustrating, but then that—that's the thing. I'm—I must be much of a townie because I thought cockerels crowing was the morning, but it's just when they're hungry. Is yeah. it? Is it food? I think it's when they're hungry, or I think yes. Um, Ian's been trained to do it when anybody's standing yeah, there with, with a microphone. microphone. <laughs> I think I think that's what it is. So yes. Now, can I just ask a question that I picked up from, from you chatting to Nick then? He was talking about um, aphid control and he mentioned using washing up liquid, but he didn't actually say how you use washing up liquid 
to control the aphids. Right. You you want a very dilute solution. So literally just a few drops of, of washing up liquids in a, a litre or a couple of pints of water and just agitate it and then squirt that on. Um, okay. It's been used for a long time. I know some commercial growers that used to use it against whitefly. Once you've mixed up your solution of your water and your, your washing up liquid, you then just spray that onto the aphids and what it does it blocks the respiratory glands and, and that is the end of them okay so i guess it's quite a clean day it is yes okay. <laughs> oh dear i thought it was going to be rubber gloves and marigolds coming into the equation <laughs> so i'm kind of glad that that didn't happen well barn sales well worth a visit and as i mentioned earlier we have a video on it so if you want to see it but even better visit in person they've got all the details on the website and we'll put their um, a link to that in the show notes and we've got some listeners questions haven't we we have yes uh, somebody who was watching our one of our videos on fig tree pruning um, and just has a question about it uh, so they say my fig tree fell at the end of spring and it was full of beautiful leaves and fruit buds my father-in-law advised me not to lift it and just to let it be on the ground and the fruit grew and it was amazing but those branches were touching the ground what do I do now it's the beginning of autumn I want to prune it I'm just not sure what to do with it being on the ground Mm. so I'm guessing they're in the other hemisphere to us up for a start because it's spring here of course but yes yes. with it being autumn that's what I'm thinking this is somebody living south of the equator I'm not sure if it's just a branch that's broken off or the whole tree okay well I I sus- yes, I wondered if it has just toppled over. I mean, I think I would have been tempted to try and, if it had fallen over, because sometimes if the roots aren't very big on a tree and they've got a lot of weight on the top, the weight of it will just lean them over. And I think I would have probably been tempted to try and gently just bring that back up into a more upright position, maybe even put a, a tree stake into tie it to to hold it in position but you've done it you've had the fruit and what I would do is I would try if it won't move now it may have rooted so that you can't lift it but if you think there's a little bit of give even if it means digging a little bit of soil out just to lever it back a little bit I would try and do that and then firm it in and stake it and then you can do your pruning um, once it's lost its leaves and, and try and prune it so that you're pruning off the lower branches and encouraging the ones that are growing upwards to, to fill that gap. So it might need a couple of prunes over a couple of seasons, but it will be fine. It's just not going to have the shape probably you want for a few years. Hmm. OK, so okay. hard to answer when there are two alternatives, but hopefully we've covered. Yeah, hopefully, yes. I mean, the, the thing with figs is you can prune them really hard and they won't die. They just could delay the flowering and fruiting for another season. But if you need to cut it harder back to get the shape, it won't do any harm. OK, good, good. Uh, and then we've got another question from Pauline in New York. Sean, do you want to ask us yeah, that one? Yeah, hi, Pauline. Um had a great rhubarb plant in my English garden, but here in Breezy Point, New York, I lost the one I planted a few years ago. Perhaps I should try again because I love rhubarb. What's the lowest temperature they can tolerate? So I wonder what the lowest temperature right. rhubarb can go Well, they, they like it cold, Pauline. I mean, I don't know how cold it gets where you are uh, in New York, but they, they originally, they, they, you know, not the cultivated forms, but the wild rhubarb uh, will grow in Siberia where it gets very cold in the winter. Uh, And in fact, it's better if it has a frosty winter than if we have a mild winter. So I would certainly say it will go down to, you know, minus 20 degrees centigrade. And I'm not sure what that is in Fahrenheit, but it's still very cold, isn't it? So certainly, (laughs) you know, we had it in our garden in North Yorkshire when we had some bad winters several years ago and we got down to minus 19 and it didn't affect it at all. So I don't think the cold will have killed it. And that's that I remember you saying about um, newer plants need to be left a couple of seasons to establish as well. Perhaps that could, could play a part, could it, maybe? Yeah, no, good point, Sean. Yes, they do. If it's a young plant, it is more prone to you know, getting uh, waterlogged or being damaged by something. So uh, I would have another go. And I mean, this is a great time to plant as well, because if you put one in now, Pauline, it's got all of the spring, all of the summer to establish um, so that come winter, you've got that good thick root system. Um, Pauline's actually got another question about drying seeds. She um, she grew some cloudy day tomatoes um, and then she had a bumper crop, kept some seeds, dried them on a paper towel, but they wouldn't germinate. Um, so what's the best way to dry seeds if you want to, to keep them? Um, I mean, I think what you've done is pretty good. You know, you'd sort of get them out the tomato, you'd, you'd wash any of that sort of slimy uh, substance off them and then put them on a paper towel to dry and that is it. And then the secret is after that, you've got to store them somewhere 
very dry so they don't get any moisture in them otherwise they'll rot and cool a fridge is perfect if you've got a fridge that's about five or six degrees that is the perfect temperature for storing most seeds um, so it might not have been your fault it might be that the seed wasn't viable in there which can happen not all seed will germinate i'm afraid but have another go and it sounds interesting. I've never grown that one. Mm, cloudy, cloudy day tomatoes. Cloudy day. She she thinks that they were developed in England. So oh uh, right. And she's yeah. she's a Brit in the US. So uh, she's obviously having a little bit of home. I will look out for it. It's one of those heritage ones. So mm. I will I will have a lot. I was talking mm. to a gentleman while I was doing a talk the other night for a. Uh, it was actually a flower club, and he was I think he said he was growing thirty two varieties of tomatoes this week. Wow, thirty two. Thirty two varieties. <laughs> He wow, that's likes going to tomatoes. be a lot of tomatoes. <laughs> mm. That's about all we have time for this week. Remember, if you've got a question for the team, well, mainly Martin, obviously. I mean, Jill and I could try and answer it, but um, <laughs> just drop us an email, info at potsandtrials.com. Info at potsandtrials.com. That's our email address. So, yeah, drop us a question and we'll get it answered on the podcast. Mm. And we'll be back again next time. We will. See Bye-bye. you then. Bye. <laughs> Watch the videos on YouTube or Facebook, follow us on Instagram, Twitter or X and subscribe to the podcast and never miss a thing. For more information, go to potsandtrials.com.